Once Joe Deschamps sits down, we will begin class. <laughs> that'll give people more time to filter in. Plus, Joe can handle it. It's a lot of pressure. There's our cue. We'll begin with prayer. Lord, open now my heart to hear, and through your word to me draw near. Let me your word e'er pure retain. Let me your child and e'er remain. Amen. New Bible study series, Ten Lies About God. Lie number one, God just wants me to be happy. Where we're going, uh, this lesson, I am going to spend the first part of the class focusing on the lie itself, how we Christians misunderstand this. Then, uh, second part of the, the class, we'll talk about the truth. Because I think you hear, as you'll find with many of these that, that we talk about, there are elements of truth. They, they sound biblical, they sound God-like, um, you probably, maybe you saw it in the, the service folder announcement, you hear someone say something that sounds vaguely Christian and you say, okay, but I don't know if that's quite true. This is one of those. God wants me to be happy. That is a, an absolutely true statement. But I think, in my observation, my experience, the vast, vast majority of the time that I've heard it used, not true. In fact, it's a lie that leads, I think, to, to many, many falsehoods and many, many sins. Uh, we'll look at some of that today. We'll look at, though, we'll, as I said, we'll spend the second part of the class talking about the truth. Um, introductory thought before we get into the introductory activity. Uh, I was reading a Bible story. We do Bible stories as a family every night uh, in one of those children's Bible story books. I love those. Um, it, it, did, it said one of those things. We were going through the story of Noah. And in the, Bible, the children's Bible story rendition of the story of Noah, it said that the people of the time, while Noah was building the ark, the people made fun of Noah. True? False? Are you sure? Where do you see that in the biblical account? It's not in there. Nowhere. I, now, everybody here said true. I said true. I was confident about it. Every story that I hear, it says it, says it happened. Not in the biblical account. Now, is that going to hurt your faith if you think that the people at Noah's time made fun of Noah while he was building the ark? No, it's actually probably very likely true because Noah was building the ark for decades. Different story. I was a, a vicar, my intern year. At, uh, at Abiding Grace Lutheran Church in Covington, Georgia. I'm not going to say any more than that just in case you guys know any of the members there. I highly doubt you know this person, though. person that I, I love dearly. She's a, a solid Christian woman. Came into my office, and, and she's a little bit crazy. you got to know that about her. Um, again, in a really, really beautiful Christian way, I love her. Uh, she came into my office, though, one day and said, Vicar, thinking about leaving my husband. Just not happy, Vicar. God wants me to be happy, right? That is, in my observation, the, by far and away, the, the most common reason or, or uh, instance where I hear that phrase used, God wants me to be happy. Typically, it's when someone is trying to justify something that, if you just say it, clearly a sin. This woman gave me the reasons why she wanted to leave her husband, not the biblical reasons we know, that the reasons that God allows for divorce, marital unfaithfulness, um, unfaithfulness and, and, and persistent sin or abandonment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, neither of those were true. Clearly a sin for her to leave her husband. The reason she was going to justify it, God wants me to be happy. Uh, 
There are many versions of this lie, God wants me to be happy. For example, God wants me to be rich. God wouldn't want me to rush into marriage, so I'll live with my significant other for a little while. God wouldn't deny me these feelings I have for someone of the same sex, and on and on. Um, usually, the person saying this phrase is trying to justify a sin that God condemns. Now, it does sound cruel to say God doesn't want me to be happy. It's a hard answer to give. So what does God want for me? How does God want us to handle this delicate, oftentimes a delicate situation where someone is trying to justify a sin or where you're trying to justify a sin? Let's watch uh, a couple of versions of this lie being taught. Again, I, uh, as I introduce the lesson, we're going to start off first half talking about the lie. Second half, we'll talk about the truth. Um, let's watch, though, a couple examples of this lie being taught. ourselves because God takes pleasure when we're happy that's the thing that gives him the greatest joy this morning so I want you to know this morning just do good for your own self do good because God wants you to be happy when you come to church when you worship him you're not doing it for God really you're doing it for yourself because that's what makes God happy amen let's open our heart to him today father One uh, some kind of example, uh, some, some truth in there, right? Some truth in there, but... Uh, let's keep going. We know that when most people hear the word prosperity, they immediately think money. They are not incorrect, but they are incomplete. For you to say that prosperity means money is for you to grossly reduce what the meaning of it, of it really is. Prosperity literally means to be successful in every endeavor of life. In fact, when it was first used, it was used to describe a prosperous journey. And it was used to talk about that I hope you'll be successful in the journey that you're about to take. So when you talk about prosperity, you're talking about being successful in life. And being successful in life is God's will. Success in life, so to prosper in your spirit is called born again. To prosper in your soul is to have a renewed or a sound mind. To prosper in your physical body is called health. To prosper in your marriage is called peace. It's being successful in every endeavor of life and to prosper in your finances. So that's a part of it, but that's not the whole of what that word means. So you, you, you've got to know that it is God's will for you to be successful and to live a successful life. He says, I come that you might have life, watch how, and have it more abundantly to have it to the full until it's overflowing. Now, for you to hear that that's not God's will, sometimes even the unsaved world has more sense than some Christians. Poverty is not God's will. If you've ever been around deep poverty, it's sickening. What kind of God would want you to, to live your life in poverty? Poverty is wicked. It's devilish. And that's not God's will. And yet 20 years ago when I began to teach this, I mean to tell you, this country came against me with everything they had. But this ministry wasn't built on wood, hay, and stubble. It's built on gold, which represents righteousness, silver, which represents redemption, and it's built on the love of Jesus. So when the fire came, it couldn't burn up the gold of the silver. And that's why it's still around. So one of the things I want you to please understand is that it is God's will for you to be successful in life. All right, 
How do you respond to people in the video clips using truths from Genesis chapter 3? We're going to read Genesis chapter 3 in just a moment. Um, we'll, after we read it, we'll, we'll look through some of these questions and then consider how we might craft a response to this thought, God wants you to be happy, God wants you to be successful, God wants you to be rich now. Genesis chapter 3, verses 15 through 19. I'll read it, and we'll discuss. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head, and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. To Adam, he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken, from dust you are, and to dust you will return. Why is the thinking expressed in those videos, expressed in this statement, God wants you to be happy, God wants you to be successful? Why is that so appealing? Okay, it's about me, what, what I can get. David. I thought that uh, we're concentrated on it as Christ crucified. That's kind of off to the side. Okay. That's not, not emphasized at all. True. Yeah, the cross, Christ crucified, off to the side, David said. Okay. Rachel? Good. Yeah, a kind of give to get kind of mentality, Rachel said. Yeah, thank you. Emma? Say it again. I, I want to be happy. So, of course, God wants that too. Okay? Please, Shelly. Good. Shel I think Shelley brings us right to the heart of it. It speaks directly to my sinful flesh, directly to it, that, that I want now to satisfy me. Uh, if you buy into this way of thinking, what is the foundation of your confidence for your life? Please. Gina. Thank you, Gina. <laughs> Happiness. That has to be the foundation. If, if, if I'm not happy... What, what, what must be the case then if I'm not happy? God must not be happy with me or I must be failing him in some way. Okay, others? David? The foundation is that you trust in yourself. Okay. I think I can accomplish this. Agree or disagree? There is profit in serving God. Let's look at some passages. Luke 6, verse 23. Rejoice in that day and leap for joy, because great is your reward in heaven, for that is how their ancestors treated the prophets. Is there reward in serving God profit? In following God, in, in serving and in loving him above all things? Absolutely. We'll talk more about that, as I said, uh, second part of the lesson. What else does Jesus say? Do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Is there profit in serving God? Uh, that, that doesn't sound necessarily like, like profit to me, like reward in, in this life. We balance both of them. Uh, there is no doubt conflict. In Genesis 3, what does God promise we will experience as a result of sin? Um, I'll Go back to Genesis chapter 3. What is the reward of living in a world of sin? The blessing that God wants if you make the choice to sin. 
Okay? So, as a result of, of sin, there is no more blessing of God. Cursed is the ground. Sweat, pain, toil, thistles and thorns. Um, oh, I, I, sh- I, I dare not forget probably the ladies, uh, pain and childbirth. Uh, th- these, are, these are the results of, of sin entering the world. And finally, I mean, ultimately, the, the, the worst of these is, is death that awaits us. Dust you are, to dust you will return. This too is a blessing. Okay, this, this is one of the key points that we're going to be focusing on today. What results if we don't experience the consequences of sin? If we think happiness is the end and we achieve happiness in this life, what do we lose? Rachel, please. We lose the need for a savior. Right at it, Rachel. Thank you. We lose the need for a savior. If we get heaven in this life, what need is, is there for heaven eternally? My response, how would you respond to someone who says, God just wants me to be happy? What would you say? Um, God does promise pain not prosperity in this life. We do live in a world of sin. This life, the Christian life, is one of conflict. Uh, Sometimes, historically especially, but even today, uh, there are those Christians who have had anything but prosperity, who have experienced only suffering and pain and persecution uh, for their entire lives. And and you've heard many of those stories, I know, in in this Bible class and in church. Uh, we, We can spend more time on those later if you'd like. What does God want for us? Read Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 and 25. Um, Verses 24 and 25, Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. What does God want for us? David, you said it before. Well, okay, right, right. Uh, Eternal life. Doggone it, David. You're getting way ahead of me. Uh, What does he want for us now? What is is life now? The cross. Yeah, you said that earlier. That's why I called on you right there. Um, Yeah, thank you, David. Uh, It it is interesting, too. The NIV uses a a plural noun or pronoun here, must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Jesus, uh, in his discourse here, actually changes this to a singular pronoun in the Greek. He wants it to be very personal. I, and that's not to say you can't, I mean, this is a fine translation. But uh, I think it's helpful to, to, to know that God, Jesus is speaking to you. Deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. Uh, it's easy to look around at the rest of the world and, and complain about the problems out there. Or uh, I mentioned it briefly in a sermon because I had a conversation with someone uh, in his house that was somewhat frustrating to me, uh, making, trying to make Christianity in some ki- into some kind of an academic exercise. This is about you. This is personal. Uh, re- repent, finally, is the call that Jesus gives to us. Two verses before this, Matthew 16, verse 22, we have Peter responding to Jesus' statement that the Savior, the Son of God, the Messiah, must go to Jerusalem. There he will suffer many things and be crucified. Um, Jesus speaking very directly about what will happen to him. He then follows it up by saying, what will happen to you? You must take up your cross too. But, but between there, we have Peter's response in verse 22. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Never, Lord, he said, this shall never happen to you. Like Peter We may have our own ideas about what we should have planned or what we would have planned for Jesus. We certainly have our own ideas about what we would like for ourselves. The chart below shows some things that we might have wished for Jesus. We'll fill in the chart to show show corresponding wishes that we might have for ourselves. Or uh, I'm going to use Shelley's word here that our sinful flesh might have for for ourselves. Um, For Jesus, Jesus is crowned king on 
on Palm Sunday. Uh, I'll maybe fill in this first blank just so you have an idea of what I'm looking for here. Jesus crowned king on Palm Sunday, uh, that, that we would be crowned triumphant over all of our sins and all of our problems in this life, never have to think about sin again, never have to be confronted by, by my sin or for my sin ever again in this life. In other words, I'm, I'm perfect now. That might be the hope that I would have and that I would never have a struggle ever again. Why would God let me struggle? Um, well, I would hope that God wouldn't, that I would never have to, to, to deal with anything in this life. Do you, do you understand what I'm doing here in this chart? Let's go to the next one. I might hope that as I read the biblical account, that everybody who Jesus came into contact with would love him. You even see that a little bit in our, in our world today, don't you? I actually see it a lot from non-Christians who say, that's not what Jesus would do when they're, when they're talking to Christians. That's one of my least favorite tropes when non-Christians try to tell Christians how to live. Um, sometimes it can be, it can be uh, uh, condemning, though, or, or uh, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Convicting. Thank you. Who said that? Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah. Um, but... Everybody loved Jesus. We know that's not the case, but what might the corresponding wish be for, for our lives? Everybody would love us. That following Christ would lead to friendships getting along easily. I go and talk to my non-Christian friends, and it would never be awkward to talk about Jesus with them. Uh, his new church grows rapidly, which, I mean, you look at Acts, there's some evidence of that happening occasionally. What might we hope for in the Christian church today? The same, right? Yeah, you, maybe you tweak a couple things and people are knocking down the church doors coming in. That no one ever contradicted or opposed Jesus, we, we might hope for that. Uh, what, what might we hope for today? Yeah, perfect unity, never any disagreements. Um, I get that question fairly regularly, or maybe, maybe more than a question, just a statement. God, God doesn't want denominations. Fair, fair enough. I mean, finally, Creflo Dollar was the, the, the preacher from the second clip. Um, it's true. God doesn't want any of these things. That, that part of the statement is true. But, but the truth is, we live in a world of sin. Does God want denominations? No. But God also says when, uh, when church bodies teach differently or if there are divisions, well, then we do have an obligation, Romans 16, 17, uh, to, to, to draw a, a dividing line and say we're, we're not in agreement. God, God gives us that call. What you've described, no denominations, well, that's heaven. Um, everybody wants to get closer to him. To Jesus. Say it again, Patty. Right. So that's the lie. That's what we might want for Jesus. What might we want for ourselves? Oh, that, that Christians would be rock stars in the community. That they would be, they would be the most popular people, idolized. Um, bearing the cross can be summarized in two words. Deny self. We've already touched on this one. Debbie, I think you let us into this one. Why is that so hard? Be, 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 because I like myself. <laughs> um, I, I had a professor who said, we're all narcissists. Some of us are just better at hiding it than others. David? Yeah, and David, maybe the point you're making here is that we're all narcissists. Sometimes kids are the best narcissists. Yeah. They're not as good at hiding it as we are. Maybe that would be the better way of saying it. The cross in a Christian's life is not simply suffering, but it's suffering that comes as a result of being a Christian. Who of us has not thought, if only I had X, I'll let you fill in that blank for yourself, uh, then I'd be happy. 
Actually, getting what we want leads to disappointment. Or the joy that comes from getting what we want only lasts a moment before the heart chases after another desire. Uh, I say within your group, but just let's, as, let's do this as a group. Identify the root cause of disappointment and discontentment. What, why is that joy or satisfaction that comes from getting exactly what you want not permanent? Why doesn't it last? Please, Gina. Okay. Yeah, you have nothing to look forward to, so you get it, and now what? I'm still, well, maybe we could even say I'm still me. Sorry, Patty, what did you say? I heard you talk. Say it one more time. Instant gratification. Yeah, we live in that kind of a culture. Good. Emma? Yeah. We are incomplete because we are sinful. Absolutely. Rick, please. I know why is pastor say to me one time that uh, talking about other pastors who leave the ministry because they have struggles in their life. And the, the pastor will leave the ministry and then still find that he has those struggles. He had identified what he thought was the problem, that the ministry, which, which can be challenging, no, make no mistake about that, but he, he was simply trying to encourage us. He said... Really think deeply about it. Sometimes not everybody is equipped for the ministry, so that's fair. But maybe it's not the ministry. Maybe, maybe you have to take a deeper look and say, maybe the root cause of the problem is the sinful flesh, that we are still sinners. And you get what you want, while well, you're still left with yourself. Let's see. Why is this the case? Romans 7, we, we bring up this section of scripture a lot. I'm not going to read that whole thing, simply because we do reference this somewhat regularly. I'll highlight maybe just two verses from it, verses 19 and 24. The Christian life is a struggle, for I do not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? What one word describes what life is for us and also what God wants for us in this life? Struggle. God, God wants the Christian to struggle in a world of sin. Think of Luther's explanation to the first commandment. We should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. What makes that so difficult for us Christians? David. The world is constantly telling us that put your trust in this or something else. Always something that you're supposed to put your trust in. So we're constantly being drawn away from it. Yep. There, there's a lot in this world that would pull our attention toward it, that would tur turn us away from God. And my sinful flesh is all too eager to give in to that. David. Yeah, you just pray over word phrases, you know, a whole self esteem like you're enough. Like that's mm. like oh, interesting. Right. That'd be another version of that lie. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. What would happen if there is no more struggle in the life of a Christian? That means two things. One, one, of, one of two things. If I no longer struggle against my sinful flesh, it either means my sinful flesh is one, or I'm in heaven. Which, I think, then transitions us uh, well here. The old self is at work when the new self is trying to be strengthened. Uh, explain how the old self is at work even when we are praying, listening to God's word, or giving an offering. So, uh, th this is the, 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 the real struggle that we all have as Christians. What we might call, or what the Lutheran Confessions, which Pastor Wester has referenced a couple times, so I feel comfortable referencing it right now. Uh, the Lutheran Confessions, which are based on the Word of God, it calls it the simul. Um, simul is just the Latin word for 
uh, same time, or, or simultaneously, you can hear our English word. Same time, saint and sinner. Simul justus et peccator. That's what we are. We are sinners. We confess that all the time. We are saints, holy, blameless, on account of Christ. So we have those two things battling inside of us, the sinful flesh. Uh, again, I love, I love that word that Shelley get, or brought into our discussion. The sinful flesh battling against that new creation of faith, uh, the, the saint, uh, holy, uh, new self. In what ways does the old self work really hard when you're praying? So we would all say, and I have these three things on here, praying, listening to God's word, giving an offering. Are all of those good things? Yes. In and of themselves, they're, they're, they're really good things. God commands all of them. Uh, they're, they're part of our Christian lives of sanctification, of living out our, our Christian faith. But as we know, we're really good at corrupting even the good gifts of God. In what ways does your old Adam struggle against you when you're praying? Kathy. My mind wanders even when I'm praying. Your mind wanders even when you're praying. Yeah, I, I find that way too easily. Gina, please. Possibly that when we're praying, God helps us to tell us what's in the right side. Hmm. Mm. Yeah, yeah. God, do this for me, and you almost start to hold God hostage. Where, do this for me, or what? What's the point, even in praying or believing in you? I, I love that parable Jesus told in our our gospel lesson today. You have the persistent widow and the unjust judge, and she just keeps banging on his door, saying, "Give me justice! Give me justice!" And even though it seems to take a really long time, finally he gives in. Now, again, parable just. One point, be persistent. That's what God wants from us. Even if he continues to say, no, no, no. We, we can still keep coming in to him in prayer, but we, we do that fully trusting that if God continues to say no, even after death, even if he never gives me what I want, well, that's still his perfect and holy will. That doesn't mean we should stop praying, though. Even if we don't see the fruits of it. Um... Yeah, that, that, and I, maybe that gets into the other part I, I think here. Is I way too easily fall into the camp that, what's the point in praying? I mean, I don't see the results, or who's going to know if I don't? Well, God knows, and God commands it. Uh, that, that's my sinful flesh talking that says, you don't, you don't need to do this. What about when listening to God's word? Where does your sinful flesh rear its ugly head there? Mm. Sam said you don't like what you hear. Emma? Feeling like it doesn't apply to you, and so you, ah, I've heard this before. Jennifer, please. Yeah. Overemphasizing certain things, and, and meanwhile letting other things fall by the wayside, that you don't think are as important? Yeah, no question. Ryan, please. Kind of like uh, when you're reading about some of the judgments of previous civilizations, and you're like, a little bit of pride, like, well, they must have been really bad. Yeah. We're like, no different. Yeah, right. How easy it is to do that when you look at the Old Testament Israelites, I, and you see them worshiping the Baals and the Asherah poles, and I think they would probably look at what, the, the things that we worship. Um, I... <laughs> Do any of you read the Babylon Bee? The, I love the Christian one. I don't, I don't actually go on the website, but I, I, my, my friends will share it. And they, they, do, uh, they do these Christian ones all the time. And Congregation gathers for worship. Tens of thousands gather for worship. Uh, and it was all about football, pro football. This was last week when the Packers played. So a lot of my friends who are pastors in Wisconsin where, yes, the Packers are an idol. Let's not, let's not mistake that. Where here maybe we would say what, I don't know. Alabama football or Tennessee football is something of an idol. I say that guilty at times myself. So if you're an Alabama fan uh, or, or Tennessee fan, I'm, I'm not going to comment anymore on that. <laughs> yeah, I think they would look at us and, you, you foolish Americans or you foolish 21st century people. Everybody has their idols. 
Who are we to think we're better? When giving an offering, how about that one? Lots of temptation there. Where does, where does the sinful flesh rear its ugly head? David, please. Want people to see what you're doing. Mm, yeah. Want people to see what you're doing. It, the question has been asked. I, I won't say it's true. I won't say it's, I, I won't say it's false. Uh, we stopped passing the offering plate. Did offerings go down? We don't, I mean, finally, we have no way really of, of tracking that. We've actually seen an increase in our offerings over the past couple of years, which is God is good and gracious, and he's, he's uh, obviously worked faith in your hearts that overflows with generosity. But we did see a drop in cash offerings, and maybe it's just sim- as simple as people not having the plate in front of them to guilt them into throwing a tenor in the plate. Possibly. Sure. Oh my goodness. And yeah. And Patty, there, there's another. There's. And I'm really. Yeah, my, I'm really good at that too, aren't I? The sinful flesh. Oh, look what he did or didn't do. Look what she did or didn't do. I'm better. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I'm also really good at saying, what, what else could I do with this money? Especially as I look at my year-end tax statement from the church and I see how much I've given, I think, oh, I could, I could have done some other things with this money, couldn't have I? Uh, yeah, again, we're all, we're all guilty of it. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10, let's read it. What does God want for us? Therefore, In order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties, For when I am weak, then I am strong. God wants me to be... Gina, please. Delighted in our weakness. weakness. Good. So that I might depend on him. Um, I I love the the imagery. God uses this in the Bible. I mean, he calls us children over and over again. It's become more apparent to me as a parent, but not... I mean, finally, everybody recognizes this. The young child who thinks he's tough stuff, but he does it because he knows he's got daddy behind him, thinks he he can take on the world. Uh, I I, I used the illustration a long time ago in a sermon. Um, It's really easy to say you don't need what you've always had. So for a a child to say, yeah, I don't need my parents, the the five-year-old, so he puts his backpack on and He's got his lunchbox with Twizzlers in it, and he takes off down the street and says, I'm going to go live on my own. I can do it. Obviously, it takes him about uh, five minutes, five hours, maybe, if he's, if he's really good. Um, but he's going to come back. We, <laughs> we, we need that reminder, don't we? That, and sometimes God will send that struggle into our lives to remind us, when you are weak, then you are strong. That's where you see how much, how much you need me. You could write your own autobiography with 2 Corinthians 12, 9 as the title. List ways that God has proven this to you in your life or how he has used the crosses of life to drive you back to his own cross. Um, so 12, 9, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. 
Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. Um, I'll, I'll share with you my favorite instance of this passage. Someone, someone had this or had requested it at, at, requested it at her funeral. I loved that. I mean, finally, there are a lot of funeral texts that you can use and that people have requested. Uh, but, but this person identifying herself by the cross in weakness. Anybody care to share? You don't have to. But anybody care to share ways that God has proven in your life or used crosses to drive you back to his own cross? I don't want to deny someone the opportunity to share. Yeah, I don't know either. Uh, but, but finally, it, it, is, it is what God wants us to, to rely more deeply on him and what he does promise and what he does point us to. King David is a good example for us. Oh, I'm sorry, Don. Please. I think we all could probably point to those, couldn't we? Yeah. Yeah. I'm Don's still kicking. King David is a good example for us. What happens when all things are going well and there's no apparent cross in one's own life? Um, so David, this is the example, Second, Second Samuel 11, the story of David and Bathsheba, where he falls into sin. Uh, David not, not doing what he ought to have been doing as king, uh, he was back home while his army was off to battle, and David gave in to temptation. And for a year, more than a year, David found himself living in impenitent sin, maybe, maybe even lost his faith, maybe. God woke him up, didn't he? He sent a prophet. And he sent the, his prophet Nathan to remind, of, remind him of his weaknesses. Uh, David, the man whom God said was a man after his own heart, even he fell into this. Again, I, I'll reference back to Ryan's point from earlier. Who are we to think that we're different or exempt or better? Uh, we need these reminders. 1 Timothy 2, 3 and 4. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. What does God want for us? We've been dancing around this, I think, the entire lesson. Does God want you to be happy? Yes. In what way does God want you to be happy? He wants you to be in heaven. He wants you to be eternally happy. Um, he, he's willing to do whatever it takes to get you there, even if that means, uh, again, I'll do that thing where I'll say, especially if that means suffering and pain in this life. John 20, verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. What's the main purpose of the Bible? To point us to Christ, uh, to, to Christ and his cross, 
especially, especially Christ in his dying. Think of a scenario, group discussion time, think of a scenario in which someone has said to you, but God just wants me to be happy. Um, let, let's use that one that I began the class with, uh, the, the woman at my vicar church who said, think about leaving my husband, just not happy, doesn't have a biblical reason for divorce, God wants me to be happy, doesn't he? How would you respond to her? You're picking and choosing what you want out of the Bible? Let's talk about that more. Llewellyn, please. Mm, really good. And probably, what's her definition? It's what I want. Yeah, it's all about me. David. Boy, that's really well said, David. The, the peace that surpasses even all understanding guards and keeps our hearts and minds. And always, Matthew, please. Well, Yeah, so not think... And, and I, boy, Matthew, thank you for that. How often when my, my happiness is the priority, does it come at the expense of someone else's Happiness in Christ, uh, where I'm pulling them away even from, from joy and contentment. Uh, so often, sin, we, we think is just about me, uh, but so often it comes at someone else's expense. Thank you for that, that focus there, Matthew. Things to remember, life is hard. I mean, that's Genesis chapter 3. Uh, the, the Christian life is hard. That's Romans 7. It's a struggle. Uh, and God wants us to be renewed in mind and spirit so that we might become more and more conformed with his will, knowing that true peace, contentment, joy, as, as David, I think, so nicely said, sometimes surpasses understanding, and I find that perfectly in Christ. Shelley, did you have your hand up? No, sorry. All right, a good quote. God doesn't ask you to take a pilgrimage to Mecca. He doesn't ask you to wash in the Ganges. He doesn't ask you to walk on burning coals or burn incense or ring bells or enter a monastery. What he asks you is much harder. He asks and insists on it. Deny yourself and take up the cross and follow me. He asks and he insists on it. Be a Christian. In what ways is being a Christian much harder than the items listed, like washing in the Ganges or joining a monastery? I think we've touched on this already. Checklists are easy. I just got to do the things, I'll, I'll go fill out my checklist and then I'm good, right God? But th this, is, this is life. This is a continual struggle, a continual life of repentance um, and denying self. Finally, I, I could summarize this. It's the difference between a, theolo a theology of glory and a theology of the cross. The theology of glory says, I'm going to get it now. Things are going to be good now. The theology of the cross calls the thing what it is. Pain. Suffering at times. Um, discomfort maybe would be the one that we're most familiar with. Yeah, sh sharing your faith even when it's hard. Uh, things of that nature. What questions do you have? Final thoughts. David, please. Mm. And I almost felt sorry for them. Mm. And they did that because, well, what, who are you praying and giving? Mm. Yeah. And for us, as we pray to God, we know that He hears and answers those prayers. I, and that, that's where I see the parallels here, too. According to God's will. I think one of the, the lies of this as well is that we often will say, all right, this doesn't make me happy, but I'll find an answer in the future. Or not. God may never give you a clear answer this side of heaven for why, why something hard or painful happens to you. 
In fact, something hard or painful might happen to you so that someone else can grow in their faith. Uh, that doesn't stop you also from growing in your faith and saying, God, I don't know the reason, and I may never know the reason. I've, I've heard so many of you give that beautiful confession at times. Sometimes in the face of the hardest thing, I still say the hardest thing uh, is, is to lose a loved one, especially, especially a child, and I've, I've heard some beautiful confessions from some of you. I don't know why. Lord, increase my faith. Let's bow our heads and pray and ask for God's blessings in that capacity. Dear Lord, we thank you for the eternal happiness that you have secured for us by your Son, Jesus Christ. As we fix our eyes in faith to the cross, give us courage, confidence, uh, even perseverance as we face the crosses in our life. Um, lead us always back to the cross and our eternal joy that is set before us in Christ. We ask it in his name. Amen.